Good day, everyone. Um, we are on our 21st session of Learning Basic Arthroscopy series of lectures. Today, I have a very important talk on fixation options in anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Okay. I would invite Dr. Srinivas to invite the speaker and the guest panelists. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have uh, uh, speaker Dr. Pawan Kumar uh, Ravi from Vijayawada today. And uh, we have a special guest from UK, Dr. Bobby Anand. Just share my screen. So Dr. Pawan is, uh, is a consultant orthopedic surgeon in Vijayawada. He's a fellow in joint re reconstruction and he has done fellowships in shoulder and elbow surgery with Dr. Sugaya in uh, Japan, I think, and, uh, and the fellowship in pediatric orthopedics with Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan. Uh, he'll be speaking on uh, tibial fixation uh, today. And uh, we have on the panel, Mr. Bobby Anand. He's a consultant uh, orthopedic surgeon with special interest in knee surgery from the UK. Uh, he's from Surrey and London, UK. He's a joint director of surgery at uh, Sweliok, uh, which is the biggest joint replacement center in the UK. And he treats many high-profile professional athletes uh, from the sporting world, and inclu which includes uh, uh, footballers, hockey players, martial arts experts. And uh, he's also leading robotic knee surgery um, uh, specialist in the local area. And his research interests focus on ACL, uh, MCL, and return to sports and patella instability. And he has served on numerous international committees over the last six years uh, and has also been invited to talks in multiple international meetings. He currently serves on the Sports Knee Committee for SICOR. Um, welcome, Dr. Ravi and uh, uh, Bobby. Um, uh, Ravi, you can take over for your presentation, please. I will just uh, stop sharing my screen. So uh, it's an honor to uh, have a, a chance to you know speak in the elite panel uh, here. Uh, Dr. Ravi, uh, thank you, Dr. Sasi, and Dr. Srinivas. It's a pleasure here. And uh, I'm starting my screen share. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Pavan Ravi, and welcome, Dr. Babi Yeah, you can go. So, is it visible? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I'll be talking on the tibial side fixation options in anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Uh, so my, a special thanks to my guru and my guide, Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, uh, for uh, uh, guiding me through uh, all my phases of life. Um, and these are the salient features of my talk, uh, where I'll be talking uh, a little bit about the biomechanics of ACL reconstruction in subsequent we have uh, the mechanics and uh, the biomechanics of uh, and roles of fixation, uh, graft selection and their suitable fixation options. Uh, what are the ideal graft fixation uh, methods? What are the great, uh, various uh, graft fixation modalities and their respective pros and cons? So these are uh, going to be uh, the format of my, this is going to be the format of my talk. Uh, so if you see. Uh, why discuss separately about tibial fixation options? Uh, when you see femur versus tibia fixation, there's a definite advantage for the femur, where uh, the bone density uh, seems to be lower on the uh, tibial side. The angle of force uh, is more in line with the graft on the femur side as compared to the tibia. And uh, the bone strength seems to decrease away from the joint surface when it comes to uh, tibia. So uh, uh, femoral fixations, uh, tend to be more stable and more reliable as compared to tibial fixations. So if you see what decides 
the fixations uh, how they succeed and how uh, they fail if you study the hull uh, group in 2005 in jbgs they said uh, the ultimate load for a graph to fail if you see the um, btv has almost 3000 newtons whereas the four standard one uh, hamstring has 4000 newtons that's it's more flexible more plastic deformation occurs early before it fails but for the implant it's only 500 newtons so that's the key that we need to understand that an implant will fail before uh, the uh, tissue itself so that's one thing that they suggested to us and why think of role of what's the role of fixation per se because bone to bone healing in bone patella tendon bone or the cqt the quadriceps central quadriceps tendon occurs around 6 weeks uh, whereas the soft tissue to bone healing like the semiti and the gracilis would take about say 12 weeks and allografts uh, take about 18 weeks uh, sometimes even more so as we know the stress versus strain curve uh, if you see what what strength i mean is the ultimate load to failure what stiffness i intend by uh, stiffness is the resistance to displacement under load and uh, slippage that's the change in the initial position after sub maximal cycles okay so if you see the graph motions what are the graph motions uh, Uh, Dr. Ba- Charlie Brown has published this way back in 2002 in the OCNA, where uh, he says bungee cord effect, that's the longitudinal motion, uh, wing wiper effect or the windshield effect, the horizontal motion, and the elongation or effect or the creep within the graft tissue. So these are the three mo- graft motions that occur. Graft tunnel motion, uh, as per the group in. Uh, uh, knee surgery uh, trauma uh, publication they say more than 3 mm mismatch uh, of the tunnel to graft diameter causes graft incorporation problem and the biological and mechanical causes are the main reasons for graft tunnel motion and uh, tunnel widening and other issues and non aperture fixation this seems to have uh, higher graft tunnel motion uh, problem so when you are focusing uh, dr frank noise has published this paper in jbgs in, in 1984 where he suggests he is analyzing uh, you know not just reconstruction but also after that we have when you go through that acl rehab uh, subject acl reconstruction uh, subjects are for, forced to about say like 150 to 500 newton forces during activities of daily living and rehab and during the first 6 weeks the graft is subject to about Uh, 220 thousand such cycles so you can see the amount of forces that you know the artificial uh, synthetic uh, not uh, artificial but at least you know the non natural ligament the graft which is just, just a dead collagen is subjected to so what would be an ideal fixation you know uh, it should be strong enough to avoid failure against load it should be stiff enough to restore the stability of the knee and it should be secure enough to avoid slippage so this would be an ideal fixation method for me so it should be at the same time it should be anatomic it should be biocompatible it should be safe the technique should be easily reproducible post surgery it should be mri compatible and whenever revision comes it revision should be facilitated easily so those are my uh, ideal fixation tech uh, you know options Then, if you see fixation options, we are now, as of now, just speaking of uh, tibia. So we are thinking in terms of bone plug or soft tissue fixation. So, if you ask me what is it, then it's simply as broad terminology. You can classify them in your ideologies as simple fixation or hybrid fixation. Where simple, I mean you use just one modality of fixation on uh, femur side and one on fem- tibia. whereas you have hybrid where you rely on more than one fixation modality uh, to fix the uh, graft on the tibial side or the femur side so this is in broad my concept of thinking as simple versus with hybrid so when you think of methodologies you'll have suspenders uh, you have screwers you have pinners and fixers so what i mean by this is 
screws as we know uh, have you know it can be titanium stainless steel are obsolete now you have bio screws which were earlier generation pla and uh, pga polyglycolic acid and polylactic acid and now we have bio composite and peak screws uh, which are more uh, easily ad- available now are more advanced but uh, i'll speak why i still favor the titanium uh, so uh, so basically what interference screw does is you know the amount by which the diameter of the tunnel is exceeded by the screw to fill in the gap between the graft and the tunnel is the um, principle by which a uh, interference screw works so so that's how an interference screw is like a space occupying thing in the tunnel to which it pushes the graft against the tunnel walls so what are the uh, advantages of uh, aperture fixation it has minimal graft to uh, tunnel motion it has less chances of tunnel widening and less creep so factors influencing uh, interference screw fixation were published by the uh, group in uh, jbjs in 2006 uh, where they said uh, length of the screw size of the screw geometry of the screw divergence torque of insertion bone mineral density and screw material have been the most important reasons uh, the factors that influence uh, interference screw fixation so uh, let's uh, study them in detail so obviously the longer the length of the screw uh, the fixation is better Uh, but uh, the screw uh, has to engage only the bone plug part when you're doing for the bone patella tendon bone. That's what is ideal. So when uh, you say about the size, uh, ideally soft tissue grafts should have uh, one size more, one size up on the tibial side. I would prefer, and for the BTB, the same size or one size down is uh, what is recommended. so uh, the rose group uh, in ajism in 94 they suggested uh, you know how factors influencing like the torque and the diameter according to it with increased resistance uh, fixation is better metal screws have better fixation that Di- increased diameter have better fixation uh, tunnel dilatation rather than drilling improves your fixation because you impact the bone uh, into the tunnel rather than remove the bone from the tunnel so uh, that's what they suggested so and screw drive divergence uh, has been described predominantly in the femur uh, because the femur inline uh, fixation has been given more importance but i feel uh, it applies even in the tibia the difference in the angle between the tunnel and the screw direction uh, makes Uh, a big impact on how f- good your fixation is uh, they say about uh, less than 15 degrees is acceptable in femur and less than about 10 degrees is acceptable in tibia uh, but uh, more than 20% definitely compromises your stability so i feel uh, this study uh, appl- uh, it was done on the femoral side but it applies on the tibia as well bone mineral density uh, less than 0.6 g per square uh, the pull out strength is definitely reduced you need to have a, a additional fixation method you probably hybrid something like two different modalities of fixing your graft on the tibial side if you're dealing with a osteopenic or a osteoporotic bone so uh, that's what they wanted to say when they started comparing uh, metal screws versus uh, bio screws which is better what is better uh, so uh, this was a important publication uh, in the arthroscopy journal uh, where uh, they said bio screws have these advantages they don't, don't interfere with mri uh, it's replaced with uh, host tissue then there is no need for removal during revision surgery and it's a non toxic non reactive material and they have good pull out force uh, also in characteristics uh, so but when you see uh, when compared to titanium screws the bio screws have higher incidence of tunnel widening 
incomplete bone in growth, osteolysis, effusion, screw breakage, cyst formation, graft tear or load uh, failure, and uh, slightly higher chances of infection or septic arthritis. So, uh, according to uh, Nedding, uh, they said uh, less with metal screws, more in bio screws, you have effusion, screw brick, according to Macquarie and Myers, they said uh, a significant problem of screw breakage and depended on the uh, material and size of the screw, especially the PLS screws without HA coating uh, are predisposed to screw breakage. And the screw sizes less than 7 mm have definitely broken more often. And uh, osteolysis, uh, there was minimal difference, but uh, the bio screws, which are more acid based, like the PLA and the PGA, because they release acidic substances when they dissolve, they cause osteonecrosis around the tunnel, and there is more chances of osteolysis and tunnel widening. Uh, HA has uh, hydroxyapatite uh, has been added. To, for two reasons. One is to give it strength uh, to prevent breakage and the other is to neutralize the acids that are released uh, during the biodegradation of the PLA and the PGA screws which uh, reduce the amount of osteolysis uh, due to the acidic material around the tunnel and uh, graft. So as we dis discussed, uh, the tunnel widening uh, which was found that uh, definitely higher on the femur side when as compared to the tibial side, but it's definitely a risk that we need to understand. And they say bone growth, in growth in the tunnels may take up to seven years uh, when you are uh, looking at uh, the properties of uh, bio screws that you're relying them, uh, relying on uh, bone in growth up to seven years. So load to failure, if you see uh, bio versus uh, this thing, uh, metal screws, you have a torque which is significant, right? that's statistically significant uh, difference that uh, quite uh, improves uh, the higher torque of impression improves metal screw fixation. Uh, if you have high torque, your fixation is better. So uh, metal screws score over the bio screws there. But uh, we found, uh, um, you know, studies say graft tear uh, rates are much lower with bio screws. My experience is a bit different, probably because sometimes uh, I'm forced to use uh, locally prepared uh, titanium screws, which tend to have slightly sharper threads. So graft laceration has been a concern for me uh, when I'm using metal screws. Uh, but uh, the soft silk and the other uh, soft titanium screws that I have used, they have not caused me graft lacerations, but uh, the other uh, locally available screws did make it. And uh, cyst formation uh, probably was not uh, quite different, but uh, if you have tunnel widening, I think cyst formation should be higher in biodegradable. The other knee scores uh, are always, uh, functional scores have never been found to be different between the tibial uh, fixations for bio as well as metal. So functionally, all scoring systems have found no differences at all. So when it comes to suspensory fixation on the tibial side, you know, it's like a graft link, uh, the dual suspensory all inside techniques uh, using uh, various uh, commercially available flip cutters and uh, various other devices. Uh, the double suspensory fixations have been available now, but uh, it's new, it's vogue uh, in the market. So uh, it's very tempting to try something new, but uh, somehow uh, I feel it's uh, not so reliable for the reasons that there's increased graft tunnel motion. There's probably more tunnel widening in these cases. And, but clinical studies have found uh, no significant differences. Uh, there are femoral data for adjustable loops. If you see, uh, uh, they have published that, you know, at uh, 4,500 4, cycles of variable load of uh, 10, 100 to 250 newtons, the construction failure uh, is occurring. That means the significant lengthening of the adjustable loops uh, after we have tightened it. So there is suture slippage of the adjustable loop. If this data is to be extrapolated to the tibial side, uh, if you have two suspensory adjustable loops, probably the amount of uh, loosening uh, or slippage of the graft loop you'll, uh, loops you'll have 
is going to be quite significant. So that's one of the primary reasons that uh, I don't rely much on uh, dual suspensory fixations. All these recent data, right, uh, not so recent also, uh, right from 2005, 6, 9, uh, you see, uh, there are so many publications which are emphasizing on additional fixation methods. You know, you need to have two or uh, one or more than one, rather, sorry, uh, more than one fixation methods for your tibial side uh, to have better uh, fixation. But these are all, uh, you know, in vitro studies rather than um, in vivo studies. So functionally, uh, there's not significant difference uh, in um, many methods, but uh, if you see, uh, these are a bit uh, worry, uh, in favor of uh, dual fixations or additional fixations, and probably it would become a common entity to have a dual fixation method uh, in the tibial side. So to summarize, uh, if you have a bone plug or a soft tissue graft, so bone plug says your bone patella tendon bone or the center CQT graft. And uh, for that aperture fixation using interference screw or the retro screw, this is the retro screw. Uh, I've never used it. This is for uh, you know, theoretical discussion and interest. And uh, fixation posts, uh, you can use uh, suture posts like these where uh, you tie the sutures uh, to the post and then tighten it. Staples uh, with or without uh, sutures. And if you have uh, uh, soft tissue grafts, then you can have single staple, uh, double staple, that's the buckle belt. Uh, this is the single staple and this is the buckle belt uh, technique. Uh, belt buckle, sorry. Uh, and uh, suture screw fixation posts uh, where you have screw and fix it with a spike washer or just to the suture post we just tie, tie them up or uh, anchor it and i have uh, recently gone through a few papers which had interesting methods of using an open stripper leaving the pest sensor in insertion intact uh, fixing it with a graft and then re-suturing it um, uh, the other ends to the uh, pest sensor in insertion so these were quite a few interesting techniques and uh, and uh, to add to these list, uh, I have uh, there's no documented evidence for such methods, but the papers coming up where people are adding uh, supplementary fixations in the form of making a small accessory tunnel near the tibial tunnel exit to pass the suture uh, loops through that and tying onto itself. Uh, so, or using something like a swivel lock uh, device to push in the residual uh, sutures into the bone for having additional fixation. Uh, so you can always uh, think of uh, adding uh, hybrid methods of fixation when bone mineral density is poor or you feel that the graft to uh, screw contact is poor or you want to have a doubly sure protected mechanism or a graft uh, tunnel contact is poor, you're not happy with the graft tunnel occupancy, a graft to screw fixation length uh, if you feel that's not sufficient you may add if you feel that your uh, graft has fallen short then you may add an additional fixation is uh, what i i used to believe and uh, probably uh, for me uh, what i would suggest is early post-operative period where fixation is the weakest team tibial fixation is probably at a higher risk of failure uh, clinical outcomes of various devices are very comparable. Um, many of them have been, uh, studies have been market driven to prove superiority or inferiority of one or the other methods. Uh, tunnel widening is definitely a concern and uh, we've been seeing it a lot more often now, now that you know we started exclusive arthroscopic practices. Aperture fixations uh, are more stable because interference uh, screws are probably the gold standard. Titanium screws, I feel, have a uh, slightly better uh, edge over the bio screws. Uh, tunnel dilatation rather than drilling improves your fixation on the TBL side, and hybrid fixation probably will become popular in future where you start worrying about uh, you know your results, then probably you want a 
play safe you want to fix in you want to put in another fixation device to hold your graph in place well so thank you for patient listening and uh, i uh, finish my talk here yeah dr sesi uh, would you so you have to unmute yourself sir uh, dr pavan can you unshare your screen yeah Have I done it? Yeah. No. No. Okay. Um. There is a stop share option. Yeah. Yeah. At, at the top. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor Shrinivas. That's a very good presentation. Thank you very much, Doctor Pawan. Um. just a, a a few questions and maybe a little bit of troubleshooting when you do um, acl regular acl reconstruction and uh, uh, revision procedures um, uh, we want your inputs also bhavi please um, and uh, how do you decide on the diameter and the length of the screw um, and how long uh, how far you pass the screw in the tunnel we'll go from basics um, um so th that's one question and uh, what is the best fixation for uh, a tendon graft uh, on, on the tbl side and uh, maybe we'll, we'll take after these two questions maybe some more questions after that haven't you okay first yeah, okay uh, with the uh, experience that i have had um first thing is uh, i i take the feel when i drill uh, probably um, if it uh, femur always i do my femoral tunnel first so uh, when i do my femoral tunnel free hand i get a uh, uh, feel at you know how strong the bone is probably is just an assessment and then uh, decide whether i'm going for the same size drill or say one size down and then uh, using an impactor to dilate my tunnel uh then uh, if i feel that uh, i probably made a mistake and i probably drilled the same size and the bone is not good uh, i uh, what i do is i take my trocar uh, and i after the graft has been passed in the tunnel if my trocar just dives in easily up to the tunnel mouth uh, then i go for two size up for uh, bio and uh, one size up for uh, titanium Usually, I prefer the same size or one size up for titanium. Uh, so that's uh, how I decide. The length, uh, of course, is based on your tibial zig angle. If you kept it around, say, fifty-five uh, degrees of your uh, tibial zig angle, uh, you tend to get around thirty-five uh, centimeters length. Thirty-five uh, mm uh, to forty mm length would be the max that you would get. In an average Indian population, it would be around thirty-five. Uh, mm so i go for something around say 25 to 30 and mm. 28 uh, is the bio screw that available for me and uh, 25 for uh, titanium uh, I, i keep it that and sometimes um, that's more than enough i feel and the uh, the screw head is flush with the cortex um, sometimes proud and uh, if i take a 30 mm screw probably i leave it a bit proud on the uh, cortical side uh, mouth side i leave it short in the intraarticular part i don't want to uh, go intraarticularly close to the intraarticular part and yeah. uh, fixation wise i think uh, now it's still a uh, single uh, simple fixation hybrid fixation i need to uh, consider unlike i have done hybrid fixations when i felt uh, my uh, graft or hamstring graft was short i needed i fixed with screw added a, a suture disc to tie uh, tie it up uh, tie the residual threads up Uh, Dr. Bobby, yeah. Dr. Pavan, thank you for your talk. I, I thought your talk was brilliant, and ninety-nine um, percent of it I completely agree with. I mean, uh, I'm very much similar to you in regards to I never use bio screws. I only use titanium for the reasons you you pointed out. Um, in terms of um, Dr. Srinivas's question, I I use titanium screw. Um, and the length again very similar to Dr. Pavan. Uh, I 25 to 30 millimeter length. 
um, of the screw. Men, most of the time with men, I go one size up with the, with the, with the uh, screw. I don't feel I need to go two sizes up with most of my patients, but uh, one size, size up is um, sufficient. Um, there are cases, particularly in women, I think, um, who have um, less dense bone. If I have any concerns, you know, pre-op, usually that decision would be made. But even when you're, when you're doing your tibial drill, if you, if it, and that's not, not any science, just based on feel, then I, I often um, protect my graft. So I do a, um, you know, a form of internal brace of my graft uh, in that risk group where I think there's a potential of slippage. So um, I'll use a synthetic device to augment the, if I'm doing a hamstring in particular, augment the, the hamstring, and then I'll fix those individually. So I'll do a interference screw and then fix the synthetic device independently. And there's been a little bit of work on that from um, Pat Smith in, in the US, who's shown um, some data on that. And, I, and I've been doing that for about a couple of years now. And, um, you know, touch wood, I don't think I've had, uh, you know, a, a, a massive problem with, with failure, early failure because of that. So, um, yeah, they're the two techniques I've been using. Okay. Um, thank you all. Very much, Dr. Bobby. I think um, Dr. Srinivas is having a couple of issues with internet. So I will go ahead with this. And thank you very much for sharing your uh, knowledge. But um, I wanted to ask about aseptic discharge with uh, bioscrews. But I guess, Dr. Bobby, you don't use, you haven't used uh, bioscrews much, I guess. No, I've, I've, I've inherited some problems from bioscrews in revision work. Okay. And um, my preference in revision scenarios is always to do a single stage if I can. And when I have a bias screw issue, I definitely agree with Dr. Pavan that maybe I only see the problem ones, but um, you often see a lot more tunnel widening. Okay. And then you're, when I've got a bio, my, my mindset is often I go to a two stage because of the bias screw. Uh, this is, okay. So that's why I have a caution about bias screws. Um, so yeah, I only see the problems from it. And, you know, historically, all, we all know about the Calaxo screw. I appreciate the technologies have improved, but you're still talking about something that's dissolving away in the bone. We don't know the impact that's having on the graft. We know that the clinical studies show no real difference, but it, it's just, I think, uh, you know, with my population, I don't like to take any experimental risk and, and that's why I don't do it. Yeah, yeah, and that's something that could trouble you postoperatively a lot and that could be a serious issue. Dr. Pavan, do you have anything to share with respect to the possibility of aseptic discharge after bioscrewing use? Yeah. Um, especially the um, previous uh, generation bioscrews, the plain ones, the PLA and the PGA ones, I had one with uh, PLA, uh, PLA uh, where uh, the graft you know, just uh, got necrosed intraarticularly. Uh, first, I thought it is uh, post uh, PGI, post uh, surgery, surgical site infection. I aspirated it, sent for culture. It was a sterile culture. Uh, then we sent it for histopath. They said neutrophilic infiltration, but not much grown. Everything was sterile. Uh, ESR, CRP uh, had uh, been very much correlating to the post operative surgical phase. Only the ESR was uh, borderline high. The CRP was negative, uh, so these were all indications that you know uh, when the probably when we had a discussion among the groups and other people, we felt that when the screw nears the expiry date, uh, probably that's when it's the most troublesome. Uh, so probably uh, you have a period of um, say one year uh, post manufacturing, you have minimal problems when you put in, but the uh, degradation products of PLA, PGLA are acidic media. So they tend to cause osteonecrosis. Uh, uh, they tend to cause a bit of osteonecrosis uh, around the tunnel because it's an acidic byproduct. So if you if to neutralize that, these companies are uh, adding uh, different composites, adding uh, bicarbonates and hydroxyapatite. So one thing is to prevent screw breakage. The other thing is to neutralize these acidic uh, debris that are uh, residuals that are released while the screw is being biodegradable. So probably uh, it's a work in progress, but uh, uh, what we've discussed is probably the 
Milagro, uh, I'm not uh, depending on any company. I'm actually not using that company, but probably the Milagro has a better composition. The that you might take uh, Milagro has a better bio composition theoretically uh, to neutralize all those acids rather than the other companies. It's a theoretical discussion, not uh, not promoting anything. Uh, but uh, by uh, by far uh, practices, I feel uh, we should encourage more for. Uh, a good quality titanium uh, in india we have locally available titaniums which tend to cause uh, more problem because of graft laceration and uh, shredding of the graft when you try to push in the screw but um, if you have good standard reliable company giving you a, a titanium screw probably that would be better uh, the only thing is uh, you know it's a fashion to have a non removable implant in your body so probably people uh, people want those you know biodegradable screws now people are asking me for trauma don't they have biodegradable plates and screws so that's the tendency so you can't deny that uh, but so you choose the uh, lesser devil and you go for a hydroxy acetate coated bio screws when patients uh, ask for it uh, you know on public demand but theoretically because you know there is no such significant data uh, probably it's uh, industry driven that you are still not uh, Uh, we're still promoting uh, bio composites but uh, titanium seems to have um, a better uh, outcome when it's more than 2 years uh, follow ups that you see you know beyond 2 years 3 years you start to follow up your cases then you realize that okay the titanium group are doing better in terms of uh, tunnel dilatation and other minor yep. leaking issues and other things the other uh, problem comes when uh, your bio screw comes in close to the joint the articular fluid keeps leaking uh, into the um, exit wound so that creates a bit more of a problem so i tend to leave it a bit at least 5 mm short of the mouth of the tibial tunnel so it uh, fills up and uh, the uh, intraarticular fluid seepage is less it, it's not that it doesn't happen but it would be lower okay um when you're when you're pushing in the screw how do you um, how do you assess how much you have pushed in it's not exactly possible to even check under x-ray and um, we do have a lot of resistance in pushing because uh, we take a size higher and how do you i mean it's not exactly possible to uh, subjectively measure the length discrepancy between the length of the tunnel and the length of the screw exactly so how do you I decide the it's not entered into the joint uh, one thing is of course uh, uh, your drill length uh, if you see your tibial zig you will get an idea that how long your tibial tunnel is going to be uh, it's around 30 35 at least uh, so if you have taken a 25 you never come into the joint uh, so yeah it's when you've taken a 30 and uh, you are near the 30 35 range that you are always in a dilemma that probably you are going to enter Yeah. and the other thing is you know we realize that most of our tibial tunnel drilling is about 70 to 90 degrees of knee flexion you know i would do it at around 70 degrees of knee flexion is when you drill your tib- uh, tibial tunnel and when you are putting your tibial screw you are doing it at around say 15 degrees of flexion with posterior drawer that's what i do so so you see your drilling angle is different and your screw putting in is different so you have to realize that Uh, you have to change your inclination of the uh, screw driver accordingly because you are drilling it at a 90 degree and you are pushing it at a 15 degree 15 degree angle so you have to adjust your inclination see uh, probably uh, uh, take your screw driver without the screw and just pass it over the guide wire and see which is the easiest flow least resistance path and then uh, try to go in through that route because uh, it's all about the feel that you know uh, in orthopedics if you are trying to push and pull probably you are doing it wrong so it has to go in smooth uh, that's my dictum of orthopedics that yeah. if you're struggling you are doing something wrong so you should go smooth uh, okay. so so i think uh, those methods like uh, using a trucker to see the path of least resistance or using a guide wire and then a, a, a screw driver without the screw and then pass it in the tunnel which is the path of least resistance and then go there probably that troubles you the least yeah yeah i do agree with uh, most of what you said uh, with respect to the aseptic discharge i did um, i did use a lot of uh, pla bio screws in the early part of my career 
and fortunately i have not had too many accepted discharge there was one particular patient who had i mean this almost the same presentation as you said um you don't actually have a infection in the sense there is not much of warmth and uh, the esr and crp are fine and the culture sensitivity turns out to be negative but uh, it keeps discharging so that is something we don't like to have even in the absence of an infection because um, what do you say the um, acl reconstruction is sort of a quality of life surgery it's not an a sort of a pain relieving surgery so you don't want to have a discharging sinus in your leg even though your knee stability has improved very well thank you very much and and uh, with respect to the length of the screw i would like to add a point that uh, the tibial plateau is sort of horizontal and the anterior surface of the tibia that you are drilling from it's sort of vertical so it sort of forms a trapezoid uh, um shape so you have to make sure uh, i specifically don't want to ha- have the screw protruding out of the tibial cortex because i do have a feeling even that could be a irritating factor to cause some sort of a discharge or even a mechanical symptom so we don't want the screw to be protruding out of the anterior tibial cortex so on the other hand you don't want it to be protruding into the joint also so so we do want to have a, a slightly more shorter screw than the uh, actual length of the tibial tunnel is that is, is that okay yeah i mean one of the um, things that i do i have to say i tr- with acl surgery everything i try and do is simplify things because it makes life easier for the staff it makes the operation quicker and simpler so with my screws i i essentially use three or four screws it's either a um 8 by 25 9 by 25 10 by 30 or in the very rare case 11 by 30 and so when you have that range you've only got four to choose from uh it it reduces the confusion but also once you're getting into those big sizes you probably want a little bit more length because it's a bigger person and with the smaller sizes if you're in the 25 you're pretty safe um you know in terms of not going through i've never had that problem i mean when i was training a, a you know a lot of people use the 35 screw particularly based on um that paper by adrian harvey that um dr pavan showed and um so there was a move towards using these longer screws and you did see these 35 um screws protruding you know it's usually through like you said through the um between the tibial spine so from a functional point of view it's probably not significant but it doesn't look good okay so we do have uh, two points to take home from what you said now one is uh, the choice of the implants you do have a particular set of choice of implant the other point i would like to take it from you especially for the learners is how to manage your staff how to train your staff you i mean you want to give a, a set of uh, uh, to have a flow chart for them to work because uh, everyone cannot think the way that you are thinking when you are in the center of the uh, war in the surgery so we want to have a uniform set of flow chart is that right dr pavan yeah absolutely uh, the more uh, uh, channelized you know if you have sops the standard operation protocol so it- life is quite simpler you tend to do it uh, smoother with less uh, friction with the staff um, so your uh, timing goes down because the staff is accustomed to you know the steps that you do so uh, forming sops is uh, always mandatory so yeah, yeah. do you uh, fix the graft uh, against the uh, distal cortex or uh, the intra articular cortex of the tibia Uh, the studies are uh, uh, so i will go for sorry since i spoken uh, the study is saying uh, previously that the screw has to be uh, posterior medial uh, in relation to the the graft uh, was what was there um, recently the trend the trend is this uh, thing like it go very well so so that's how um, probably i don't uh, i just uh, go for the easiest least path of resistance Yeah I mean the only thing I would add to that is uh, most of the time I would say I would go posterior medial but you know you can use that screw to manipulate your graft position and so that is quite handy sometimes so if you want to do some fine tuning of your graft position it's not often you need to but you can decide where you put your guide wire you know mostly you, you lift your graft up put it put it behind but uh, you can decide that position and that can influence where your graft ends up so that, 
that's a little um, tip that some you know you can use to do subtle manipulation of the graft. Um, you which is pass the guide wire all the way into the joint to prevent divergence of the screw. Absolutely, yeah, and that that's the other key thing. I mean, one of the because I don't know, you know, everyone uses different guide wires. I'm very cautious about using the the you know one point two um, uh, five millimeter, the one that they use with the bio um, screws. Those guide wires are much more prone to diverging off. Um, so I prefer to use a, a much thicker t a two point something or other guide wire, much more rigid, because then you can feel it going into the joint, and then you know you're not going to get that divergence. And you you must feel your guide wire going into the joint um, to avoid that divergence. What do you feel about tensioning device for the graft before putting the screw? Uh, uh, do you want for me? I, mean, uh, uh, yeah. I, I think, I mean, I, 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 when I started out, I used a tensioning device, um, but I don't think it adds much value. There, there's been a couple of good papers, they're probably five, 10 years old now, um, that looked at the tension you put the graft into and the change in in you know length and laxity and there is no i personally feel that you've got to put in as much tension as you can and then the graft will find its natural tension uh, within the knee when it goes through cycling so I, I don't get too fixated on um on that in particular i do you know fix my graft in extension um when i fix it but i i i i, I tension it as much as i can in extension okay so pulling we, uh, how do we make sure how much tension to give to the graft? And we are doing manually. Uh, it's very variable, isn't it, from surgeon to surgeon? Pull hard, be strong. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's something I do also. I do. I don't tension my grafts, um, but um, cycling is a very important part of the procedure. So make sure there is not much of a kinking or um, relaxed graft. And uh, I don't internal rotate or external rotate the tibia. I just pull hard on the graft. So the graft and uh, position your knee in such a way that the, uh, automatically the tibia subluxates posteriorly or is not subluxating anteriorly anymore. So And if you're going to push in with the screw, that is also going to reduce your uh, anterior subluxation. So I personally prefer not to push, my, push the tibia backward to shorten the shorten the graph uh do you do you uh push the tibia backward when you're trying to fix i um what i do is uh, i shorten my threads over a mop or a uh, bandage roll so that the, i have a grip on the thread and uh, i short enough that with one hand if i'm pulling it i'm so close to the shin that my hand exerts a posterior draw so uh, when I'm close, uh, I have a close grip on the graft, probably my knuckles would automatically push the tibia sufficiently back rather than some assistant uh, pushing the tibia uh, intentionally behind uh, my own knuckles. Uh, when yeah. You're sort of levering the graft outside with your hand. So uh, your hand is pushing the tibia back and your yeah. fingers my are knuckles, the... My knuckles would be yeah, pushing yeah, yeah, the shin yeah. posteriorly. Okay. Uh, I think the, uh, I, I agree. The main thing is you want to. Um, yeah, Doctor Bobby. Yeah, so I think the main thing is particularly when when people are starting out with their ACLs, uh, you you got to make sure because it's you're using you know for example if you're holding with your non-dominant hand the graft and putting the screw in, you just got to make sure you're concentrating on maintaining that traction because if you're putting your screw in, you start focusing on the screw, you take the tension off. So it's just for the beginners, that's really important to be conscious of both hands when they're operating. Yeah, um, I think this uh, goes along with the next question. So my next question was, uh, how do you prevent twisting of the graft, especially for the beginners, when you're trying to push in the screw? I think uh, your, I mean, your statement answers that question, pulling the graft very well, right? Yeah, pull, or pull the graft, pull, else it, pull it out of the way. And again, uh, like Dr. Pavan said, it shouldn't be hard work. It should be, you know, depending on the type of screw you use, maybe the first two or three turns require a lot of force. But after that, it should be nice and controlled. And you yep. should be watching the graph, making sure it's not getting caught in, in the um, in the screw. So it is just doing it slowly. Uh, you know, 
you don't want to rush it in last minute after all the good work you've done. Nice, slowly. You don't want to damage the graft when you're putting it in. Um, so it's just everything in a controlled way under direct vision. And, uh, more so when you have a suspensory fixation on the femur, uh, the chances of graft uh, toggling around in your screw on the tibial side is quite low. I feel the wrap, uh, wrapping of the uh, screw around the graft is more on the femur side rather than the tibial side. Um, I feel uh, I never had uh, that sort of a problem. Probably lucky that my, my the path, uh, the method that I opted to fix have always helped me that way. But uh, I had uh, initially problems when I'm trying to fix the uh, graft on the femur side with the screw. Intra-articular screws, I used to have a graft which is rolling around my screw. But tibia, if you do it properly, properly, uh, you would probably not have a problem of uh, you know your winding up of uh, graft around your screw. You need to I hold it firm. Yeah, the main thing is to avoid getting your guide wire through going through your graft. So when you're putting it, so if you put your guide wire accidentally through the graft when you're put, doing your tibia, then I think you can get into that problem. Okay, there is a question from the audience. Um, uh, what is your experience in comparison between a suspensory fixation on the tibia and a post uh, suture bridge fixation on the tibia? Both as per your experience and the available evidence. Suture yeah. bridge is basically, uh, you know, it's like uh, trying to create two tunnels. Uh, after that, uh, separate tunnel for the exit of the suture ends, and then uh, you're trying to either uh, resuture it or uh, tie on itself. Uh, so, uh, just because. Um, See, you need a strong fixation. We are talking of uh, load to failures of around 500 newtons. So the device is like, a, uh, if you are using it as a hybrid method, probably it does well. But using it as the only method, probably uh, it will fail. It's it not advisable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Dr. Bobby, do you have anything to say? No, I, I agree with Dr. Pavan. Nothing, nothing wrong. Yeah. Okay. What about osteoporotic bone? So always I, uh, I, I, I would go for an additional fixation device uh, because uh, uh, my practice is routinely quadrupled semi-T, isolated semi-T. Most of the times I have a quadrupled uh, isolated semi-T. My graft ends usually at the mouth, uh, most of my uh, surgeries. So if I feel the fixation with the, my screw is poor, I add in a suture disc to tie my suture ends. So, or if I feel it's very lax, then probably I'll put in a staple. So what percentage of your cases did you need the additional fixation? Five uh, percent, less than five. Last uh, eight years, five percent. Yeah. If you feel the fixation is, if, if, if you're unsure about your fixation, um, what do you if do? I'm unsure, I have not cut in my sutures, I just unwind the screw and put in a bigger diameter screw. Because I've, uh, I've cut my tibial uh, end of the sutures of the graft the last, just before giving the wash in particular. If I feel that my screw hold is not good, I don't mind changing it to a bigger diameter screw. Okay, so unwinding the screw is possibly uh, feasible in a metal screw. It, it possibly it cannot be done with a bioabsorbable screw, I guess. Oh, no, it does. It um, I mean, Indian jugards probably, but uh, I've, I've managed to do it a couple of times uh, for bio also. Uh, bio, uh, I'm actually very scared to uh, undo my uh, titanium ones because the titanium ones tend to be the poor people, uh, poor uh, you know, subsidized surgeries that I do where. I'm using a local substitute of titanium screw. So uh, I'm very afraid that my untreading may lacerate the graft. So it's it's then that if my I feel that my locally made titanium screw is weak, that's when I put in a staple or a suture disc to it. Bio screw, I'm very confident and happy. I unwind it anyway, it's a waste of screw. The threads will but unwound. I throw it off and take a bigger diameter and put it there. Uh, it, it does happen that when you're trying to unwind the screw, the threads on the bio screw gets unwound and they disintegrate. 
So that's anyway a, 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 a screw that's wasted. So it's not a good deal. I, I want a bigger fixation. So let it unwind and throw it, remove the small debris in whichever may come intra-articularly and then re-thread it with a bigger diameter. Yeah, I mean, I, the only thing I would add to that, I think it's better to try and preempt the problem than to have to deal with that. And um, as I probably said earlier, you know, if, if you've got a female, once you've done your drilling, you're, you're worried about the, the bone being soft, then you know, go two sizes up on your, on your screw. That's the first step. Um, but also, as I, I tend to now um, internally brace the graft as well and independently fix that uh, with, um, you know, a, an anchor or whatever device. I, I'm personally, I'm not a big fan of the staples. I, yeah, maybe I just don't know how to use them properly, but I, I don't, I, 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 I've used a staple a few times and, and I don't think they, yeah, I personally don't think they make a, any difference. And interestingly, the two times I used it, one ACL failed. Um, so I always remember that it was a rubbish fixation. The staple didn't help the fixation and it failed. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the staples, but I, I don't know. Do you regularly internally brace your uh, graft? More regularly than I used to. I never used to. Now, if I have any concern about um, bone quality, um, if if they're you know particularly high demand uh, professional sportsmen, they all they all get it because it just means I've done everything. Um, I will double fixate the femur as well in this osteoporotic group because um, you know I, I'm not happy on it. If you've got osteoporotic or soft bone. I'm not fully happy with a isolated suspensory fixation, so I'll do a, a screw and a and a suspensory fixation. The uh, brace and the graft are tensioned separately, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so um, that's ideally what you should do. But I, I, essentially, what I what I try to do is I I will tension the graft to the maximum, and then just leave a little bit of tension off the brace. And that is just on feel, you know, when you're you know, just leaving a little bit of tension off it and tension them separately. Yeah, yeah. And how sorry, much how that you... materializes into reality, I don't know. Yeah, and sorry, how do you fix your uh, brace on the tibia? With, with, with the screw. How fix? Um, so okay, so, you, the, you brace, the, same... the brace. I use a an anchor. Uh, I use a swivel lock. Swivel lock. Okay, Which swivel lock on the cortex separately separate. from the interference. Yeah. yeah. But the brace and the graft are fixed by the interference screw as well, isn't it? Yeah. And that, I think that's the point. To, you know, if you're worried about screw slippage, it's an extra protection. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, is there is a concern. More... Sorry. There is a concern that uh, the smooth surface of the brace can tend to slip in yeah. between the screw and the tunnel. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Pavan? Yeah. Uh, what... Uh... What I have been suggested, you know, when if you are thinking in terms of internal bracing, is first uh, internally fix the uh, internal brace uh, with in extension or in your extension, uh, so that it's the maximum loose uh, or lax at that point, and then uh, fix that with uh, like something like a swivel lock, and then go into your interference screw for the graft at around 15 to 20 degrees or 90 degrees, whichever your choice. So you have differential fixation because. Once it is long enough, then you can fix it. Or make a separate small tunnel uh, at the tibial exit. Some people have suggested that too. But uh, trust me, I've never done internal bracing and it's, it, it becomes too complicated. Yeah, don't. I wouldn't advise that. I think you can create more problems than good. It's more expensive okay. as well. <laughs> Okay, and uh, we did have a couple of uh, discussions earlier in our meetings and uh, there was a, a surgeon, Dr. Alex Weissman from Chile. He shared his experience on uh, internal bracing, um, but uh, that was with a suspensory fixation on the tibial side. So his suggestion was if a suspensory fixation, especially a um, adjustable loop one is being used, uh, he takes the brace in one of in the two holes of the button, um, the the knee is taken to zero degrees for tightening the brace, and then it is taken around twenty degrees of action for tightening the graft. So in this way, the graft is 
more taut than the brace and there is some sort of a seat belt mechanism that is happening on the brace okay so that is one possibility if uh, a suspensory fixation is being used on the tibia mm. okay uh, there are the studies coming up you know uh, probably will become too market driven uh, in going for dual suspensory fixation you know the uh, fact is that uh, some day we'll come to realize that uh, adjustable loops will have definite uh, not slippage you'll have a adjustable loop which will lengthen and imagine if you have it on both sides and it's so stretched out so we're going to have a definite graft laxity um start, once i started following up my adjustable loops for say more than 2 years i started to have a feel that you know my uh, grafts are probably uh, getting uh, stretched more uh, frequently whenever i'm using uh, i'm getting one plus laxity in a well done uh, loops uh, adjustable loops rather than when i used to do with uh, uh, fixed closed loops so uh, probably you know it's uh, why i shifted to uh, the adjustable loops was because the graft tends to occupy the entire socket you know uh, there is uh, less chance uh, when you use a fixed loop you, ha you have to create a 55 mm more uh, tunnel uh, length or the socket length for the button to flip so you have more uh, empty dead void space for the graft uh, fluid to seepage uh, and cause tunnel widening which is considered as an important fact that you know your synovial fluid which is going into the socket and causing tunnel dilatation so uh, that's what i thought probably if you uh, fill the uh, graft with uh, the entire socket you'll have less chance of this but uh, i started to have more than uh, grade one laxity uh, for my suspensory fixations with adjustable loops so if you have it on both sides probably it has a problem and i was discussing with my senior colleague uh, he said he had an instance where uh, because of the tightening the button on the femur side tibial side uh, uh, caused pressure necrosis and it went into the uh, cortex you know uh, lateral movement so people are having different sort of problems uh, that's why uh, hearing these uh, probably i have uh, experimented once or twice but uh, luckily it doesn't happen and after that i have shifted back to always gold one uh, femoral suspension and tibia screw fixation okay i do i do like to share our experience over in our hospital mm, i have been using a uh, hybrid fixation that means uh, suspensory on the femur and uh, metal or uh, bio hydroxy appetite coated bio absorbable later and uh, earlier i used to use plla and uh, since 2 years i have been doing uh, all inside fixation with suspensory adjustable loop on both sides on the femur and the tibia and uh, that is since two years that i have been there in my current institute or hospital but um, i have had a follow up of the previous patients who have undergone a adjustable loop suspensory fixation on both side yeah there is one plus so even on both even on using on both side there is one plus of uh, laxity but uh, um, i have never felt very uncomfortable with it fortunately our patients have been doing quite well Mm. and uh, there are no specific um, incidences of um, failure because of suspensory fixation on both sides we do manage uh, even uh, revision acl reconstructions sometimes with uh, double suspensory fixation they do real well but most of our patients they don't come with a lot of uh, widening even when they are operated by other hospitals in other hospitals they don't come with a lot of widening we have a significant number of uh, experience using suspensory fixation they do quite well but i totally agree that we need to be concerned of the possibility that there can be some amount of um, not slippage on both ends so possibly in a patient with a hyperlaxity with a high beaten score i wouldn't prefer to use double sided suspensory fixation uh bobby um do you have any difference in your philosophy uh you know post op rehab for uh, regular uh, routine acl reconstruction uh compared to acl reconstruction in sportsman in terms of uh, bracing and uh, post op uh, rehab uh the short answer is no um the i mean 
I'm very, uh, I used to be, when I first started out, I was overconfident with myself. And so I, I basically, my view was they can go and do what they want. Now I'm uh, much more cautious. I, uh, the first six weeks, I like the patients to take it easy. I mean, after six weeks, I've become relaxed again, but uh, because I'm convinced that the fixation is the, the weakest link, I just want some healing to take place in that first six weeks. And so my rehab is all about early on um, getting the swelling under control, all the basics, you know, swelling control. So the advantage with the, with the athletes is they all have access to um, the gate. You know, I, I recommend they get the game ready. I think it's brilliant. I don't know if you use it a lot, but um, so all, all, my, all my patients get the game ready. Um, and so they get, and that definitely makes a difference with the, with the swelling. And then they focus on getting, uh, you know, basics, the VMO firing, early rehab with the VMO firing, getting the extension back. Once they've done that, um, you know, that's given them something to keep their mind busy on for the two, three weeks, so it slows them down. I used to, uh, if I'm using a hamstring graft, I have to say in the past, I'd let them get go cycling in two weeks, get on an exercise bike. I try and defer that now for four to six weeks. And it's again, just because of the cycling effect of it, uh, the, you know, uh, and, um, Dr. Pavan's highlighted some of the, the, the motions that take place within the graph. The, um, and so it's just to try and minimize that. Um, and, uh, you know, the, some of the physios don't like this. I prefer to stick to closed chain for the first four to six weeks, uh, closed chain exercises. Um, and I know the evidence is that you can do both. Um, but my stance on it is I don't want a failure, particularly in high demand people. It's a disaster. So I'd rather they go careful in the four, first six weeks. It doesn't slow them down in their long-term rehab at all. They will catch it up. I don't brace them. Uh, I trust them enough not to brace them. Um, but I suppose the biggest uh, thing is, so the, as I said, the short answer is no, but those are the little things I do differently. Um, but if they have higher risk factors, so you know all the things we all know about, if they have an increased tibial slope, if they have hyperextension, if they are various, um, I, I'm much more aggressive in doing a, an ALL in that group with them. Um, and secondly, if they have a significant MCL injury, I will address the MCL as well. And, I, and, I, and you know, if it's a grade two plus, three-ish, I'll address the MCL early on. So that that's the only um, difference, really. I was, I was going to ask you about ALL in sports person. You have answered that. Probably ALL is a pre-op uh, decision, you know, your uh, extracurricular TV decision. Yeah, absolutely. And everything is a pre-op decision. You would have already dis uh, done a pivot shift because, you know, it has to be a uh, quite a cold knee, you know, where it's like uh, you're able to do good range of motion. You, you should be able to elicit your pivot shift, uh, your virus called distress and laughing and anterior drawer. Everything you're able to assess, it's then that you take a decision of, an ACL reconstruction plus minus LET or ALL uh, based on your uh, pivot and uh, dial test. Uh, so you should be able to have a uh, pre-op evaluation uh, even before you have entered your OR that uh, everything is pre-planned that uh, this guy would need um, extra articular TVDCs or ALL. Uh, I, I do an extra articular modified lemma uh, whenever I have uh, uh, extra pivot. Uh, of course, uh, of course, uh, lateral meniscus posterior horn is something that you need to watch for your cramp lesions and you know, posterior horn lateral meniscus. Uh, for me, physio is constant. I always brace my long knee brace uh, because due to graft harvest, uh, patients tend to have a flexion attitude due to pain uh, because we have meddled intraticularly. So I feel that my patients uh, tend to have a flexion attitude. To prevent that, I use my long knee brace to push the knee into extension, maintain it in the extension. I keep them non bearing for almost four weeks. My range of movement is first two weeks, zero to 30, then increments of 30 degrees every two weeks. So they reach about 90 degrees at around uh, four, four to six weeks. So uh, 90 degree flexion. So six to stand and then. Uh, the studies have said that the graft ligamentization or the tubularization occurs at around six to eight weeks. That means, it's, uh, you know, like the snake leaves its shell, uh, its clothes, uh, the outer skin. The, the graft collagen is just the outer sheath that's left and everything else has disappeared by uh, six to eight weeks. So 
if the weakest part of the reconstruction the physiologically it's the weakest then if you start your rehab which is aggressive at that point you will have a plastic deformation of the graft so uh, probably you have to have four to six weeks of relaxed period for your uh, fixation devices to uh, do well fix and heal your biology section and the tunnel to graft healing that has happened and then after the tunnel to graft incorporation starts or you know it's at a reasonable good stage it's when the actual intraarticular part of the graft that you have to look after that's where the ligamentization and the tubularization of the graft happen so your six up to eight weeks i don't mind being uh, very calm and subtle after eight weeks yeah uh, by then my patient is able to do close chain exercises and uh, six to eight weeks uh, is when he does uh, cycling and close chain exercises and after eight weeks i have a gym protocol which is quite more aggressive so uh, uh, i'm really relaxed up to that's, six yeah that's weeks. that's very very slow i mean i i have to say i don't think my population would tolerate that i think my concern with that would be the 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 muscle wasting involved would be phenomenal and um you know that uh for any athlete is the biggest problem um so that's why i, I mean I, i have to say within two weeks I, i get my guys in the gym they can they can start squ squats they can start weighted squats within two weeks as long as the swelling is coming down because i really want them to start getting the hamstring strength back early um that's my concern with with that delay that you know you know we know that your quads are going to waste significantly but also the hamstrings are going to be quite weak um and that's quite a slow progress after that how have you found that uh, yeah uh, i do agree i have a, a issue with uh, that and i have to ask my physio to give a uh, tense stimulation uh, to get the quads uh, going in few occasions uh, i have uh, a graph uh, got a mismatch of the high of both sides of, for almost for one year i uh, i have that concern but uh, when i see that you know it's a theoretical discussion that always goes in my mind that uh, because it's become just a tube tube like collagen nothing else is there inside it it's going to undergo plastic deformation if i'm going to stretch it so what if is the only thing that goes uh, goes uh, in the back of my mind Uh, so uh, i'm uh, for my athlete population yes 6 uh, weeks and uh, for normal population 8 weeks that 2 weeks is uh, the difference for me but it's not that they're not doing anything they're doing uh, brace assisted slrs they're doing uh, uh, other static quads calf pump bridging pelvic floor they focus on their core strength that the glutes and the lumbar region uh, so and uh, because you know the graft has been harvested the hamstrings are harvested it's just that the uh, muscle tendon junction the muscle is just gone and attached to your uh, semimembrane osseous so i don't know uh, i'm focusing on quads for sure uh, hamstrings i'm a bit slow probably because they are, even the that has to heal the muscle belly uh, of your semi p uh, has to go and attach to the semimembrane osseous so that healing also happens by say four to six weeks then you can start pulling and pushing it uh but yeah uh, i think those two weeks i'm a bit late than many people it this question has always uh, been in my mind whether do you actually have to delay the hamstring strengthening because you have harvested the hamstring um uh if you ask me personally i am not a i mean i i, I don't uh, delay my hamstring strengthening too much i am of the opinion that uh, uh, other long flexors in addition to the semitendinosus and gracilis and uh, the semitendinosus and gracilis they are like uh, it's like a complete radial tear of the meniscus so it's not there anymore so uh, so there's no point in delaying any i mean uh, delaying for the sake of possible healing but on the other side there are also studies saying that uh, it does reform again by around 6 months and there is one study that is possibly coming up soon from the knee registry of sweden that at 6 months the hamstring strength is almost more than 95% of the normal side 
Yeah, I mean, even I was, after draft harvest. When I was a, a, a fellow out in Melbourne um, with uh, Julian, there was a research project going on that was following. It was a really interesting project on his um, professional footballers, and he was doing um, isometric and um, he was he was testing essentially hamstring strength in many modalities. And interestingly, in that group, at one year, every and they all had hamstring ACLs. Every single one of them, uh, if I remember correctly, had stronger hamstrings on the operated side than the non-operated side. Um, so not 90%, they were actually stronger just because these guys just rehabbed so well. Um, and so I think the, the potential to, for the hamstrings to recover is generally very good. And I have to say, in my experience with, with, with my patients is you get a group that are just awesome and you know, don't have to worry about them at two weeks. They are doing great hamstring strengthening and, and they, and they, and they sail through it. And I'm, I'm quite keen on early hamstring rehab. I think it helps them in the medium term, short to medium term. Um, and, uh, but you definitely get a small group uh, in the hamstring uh, population that are slow and they, they do struggle with hamstring pain, but it, it's a very small group, I think. Do you, for the ALL reconstruction, do you do modified limer as well? No, I don't. I, I do a, um, so I use a uh, synthetic graft. I do a, um, so I use a um, polyester tape by a company called um, Kairos. So we're writing, we're collecting the data on it now. We've got, uh, I think it's, it's, it's a technique I developed and we're, we're writing it up. And so it's, their patients get three tiny nicks, three, uh, you know, five millimeter incisions um, over the isometric points. And um, you do, uh, do a V-shaped ALL reconstruction with it. Uh, so Non-anatomic? Uh, well, I, I would call it an anatomic ALL. And I mean, the mayor is the most non-anatomic you can get. Um, so, but I know, it's very, I know it's very popular, but it's nothing it, it, about the Le Maire procedure. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, either it will be an anatomic, non-anatomic ALL because it's anatomical location, but not a graft. Yeah. The yeah. tibial side is two points, is it? And the femoral side is a single point. Femoral side, one point, tibial side, two points. Okay. And what are the two points on the tibial side? So tibial uh, side, you essentially, um, I, I best show a, a diagram. So you, it's based upon, you know, the, uh, you, the ALL has had about four different anatomical descriptions. Um, let me see if I've got a picture handy, I'll, I'll share it. But I base it upon that. So I use the tibial um, Gerdes tubercle as a landmark. And so the first, the first one is slightly medial to Gerdes tubercle, not on Gerdes tubercle. Um, and then the second one is slightly more superior. The second one is the one that's a bit more risky because you're going very close to the joint line. Um, and so I base it upon, uh, you know, the, the paper from the, the Belgium group because, uh, you know, they, they've, they've, they've given a good illustration of that. So I try and reproduce that um, with a very, I use a three millimeter uh, tape, polyester tape uh, for that. And then three, three anchors to hold that. Um, I have used um, gracilis uh, mm -hmm. using the same technique with gracilis you can do as well. So if you want to use a, a biological graph, but I'm, I'm pretty relaxed about using uh, this tape uh, outside the joint. So I, I prefer to save the gracilis for, for, for a hamstring if I'm using it. Is your rehab different if you do an ALL? No. Same. And I had a question regarding your um, early rehab. Like you said, uh, you start the squats at two weeks. Does it happen even when you don't use a brace, internal brace? Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same same rehab for everyone. I, I don't believe in having different rehab for an athlete or, a, or another patient because if it's you've got to do what you think is best and that should be best for everyone, not for one particular group. So yeah, I, I do the same for everyone. Yeah. Uh, if they can, I mean, not everyone can tolerate that, you know, uh, at the two week check, you, you, uh, you get a group, you get 30, 40% of patients who, who look like they've not even had an operation. Uh, they're, they're sailing through, you get a group that are steady and then you get a, a, a group, maybe 20, 30% who are really rubbish at two weeks and they're really struggling. They can't get extension. Um, so that uh, that review for me is really important for that for that patient group. For my good group, I, all I'm trying to do is slow them down because they do they're doing too well. They need to slow down before they have a problem. My middle group are my best group, and then I have my slow group, which are the important ones where you're 
going to try and support them more with the rehab, getting their extension. Um, so, yes, that's what you aim for. But every every group, as as you all know, is different, and it depends on multiple other factors. You know, biological factors that we don't understand. Um, you know, condral damage to the knee, whether they've had a meniscal repair, obviously changes the picture. So there's lots of other lots of other factors in that. Okay, I guess that's all. Uh, we had a lot of questions. We don't entertain. We don't have any more questions. So I think it was a wonderful session. Where there were very lively discussions on multiple talks on uh, a multiple aspects of your side fixation. Uh, Dr. Srinivas, do you have anything else? No, that's it. No. Okay, Good. thank you very mm -hmm. much, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Pavan. It was a wonderful talk, and uh, Dr. Bobby for uh, taking the discussion stop notch. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me again. We Thank hope you. to see you both sometime soon. In nice future. to see you. Yeah. See you. Take care. Take care.